The Dukes of Dice is brought to you by Arcane Wonders, Game Toppers, making a huge purchase during a pandemic, and listeners like you. Welcome to the Duchy. It's time for another episode of the Dukes of Dice podcast, a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. Coming to you from the Duchy of the Duke City, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the Gateway City, St. Louis, Missouri, it's... The Dukes of Dice, a podcast about board card and occasionally role-playing games. Today, the Dukes review Eckert Spiel's Alma Mater. Then they take a look back at their review of the Taverns of Tiefenthal in their Dukes Double Take. And now, the Dukes of Dice. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is Sean. And Alex. And this is episode 244, The Bar Exam. Alex, the bar exam, that name title, thanks to D. Shannon. Of course, we're talking about Taverns of Tiefenthal in our Duke's Double Take, which is all about man- managing a bar. Um, and then we're talking about alma mater, higher institution where you're taking exams and such. Uh, and the bar exam, you know, that goes together perfectly, which of course is what certain professionals known as attorneys or lawyers or counselors are required to take, here, at least here in the U.S., before they can be, uh, they can practice practice law. So, when I and as I told you, Sean, as before we got rolling, I also took a bar exam of a certain kind because I was uh, in bartending school, which I didn't end up using because the same day I got my first job as a bartender, <laughs> I got a job in TV news and moved to Lansing, Michigan at the time. So yeah, uh, it was equally difficult. I might add, you got to get those mixers just right. So Alex, I have taken, I have taken two bar exams, two bar exams. And of those two bar exams, how many, how many did I pass? I would say one. No, I passed both. Oh. Yeah. Oh, little, little background information. So I went to school in Tucson, Arizona. That's where I grew up. I was born in Al- here in Albuquerque, but I went to school. I, I grew up in Phoenix, um, went to law school in Tucson, and then got started the divorce process in my third year of law school. And so what wound up happening as I was preparing for the bar after graduation, the summer after graduation, it was, it was a weird time just for many reasons. Plus you're studying the bar like 60 hours a week. I missed the application deadline for the summer or sorry for the, yeah, for the summer Arizona bar. I missed it. And I'm freaking out. I talked to my parents. What, what, do, what do I do? I can't believe I missed this. How did I miss this? Um, and they said, well, how about, since you're going through this divorce, why don't you come out to New Mexico? There's still time to register for the New Mexico bar exam. Uh, stay here, you know, a year, and then take the Arizona bar exam, and then move back to Arizona. So that's what I did. And that was, that was the plan. The plan was to come here to New Mexico for a year or two practice law a little bit, and then move back to Arizona because I figured my whole life was in Arizona. So I was here. Uh, so I took the New Mexico bar, passed my first time. Um, and then I uh, took the February uh, Arizona bar exam, still intending to go back, and flew out to Arizona, hung out with, uh, with one of my buddies, Gary, and took the bar exam over two days. I mean, this is, this is like 10 hours. 10, 12 hours over two days, um, tons of studying beforehand, even for that second time, tons of effort. It was like 500 bucks. I passed that, found out, you know, weeks later, months later, whatever it was, I passed that. And then I went to do (laughs) the background check portion for Arizona. So the background check portion for New Mexico was like six pages and it was super simple. The background check for Arizona was like 25 plus pages. And I'm like, oh my God. So I kept putting it off and off and off. And then eventually I started to settle here into New Mexico and I just kind of blew it off altogether. Uh, And then there was a certain time limit for, for that to go through. And I never, and I never did. And, you know, 10, 11 years later now, but to think all of the effort, like the bar exam both times was one of the most stressful things I've ever done. Like it, it was, it's just, you're, you're just, oh my, oh man, it's rough. And to think that I went through it a second time passed, not that I would do anything with, with an Arizona, you know, 
licensure, but whatever. Anyway, hey, thanks to Shannon for that fantastic suggestion, <laughs> the bar exam. And of course, we get help naming all of our episodes for the Dukes of Dice over on our board game Geek Guild, which is guild number 2008. And we've got some fantastic, Alex, fantastic runners up that we'll tell you about at the end of the episode. I mean, we had to make up reasons to throw some of these out. We had to be like, ah, yeah, I don't like their face. They're gone. Don't like this one's maybe slightly missed. Oh, this gone. Like, no, this was a this was a killer week for names. Fire. Everyone was on fire. Absolutely. So. So, yeah, Alex, uh, any major life decisions in the last <laughs> time since we recorded? <laughs> yeah, in fact, in fact, there have been so many things that have happened, Sean. Uh, so as mentioned last episode, I started my new job. Uh, this was, we're just, as of the recording of this, wrapping up my second week. Things have gone fine so far. No issues. Going well. Uh, got all my swag. I've got, I've got a, a jacket. I've got a backpack they sent me. It's weird. They didn't send me like a typical plastic water bottle. They sent me a glass water bottle. Okay. Kind of looks like an old, old timey milk jug, except with a, with a cool stopper on the top. Anyway, sent that over, have a pen, have a little notebook. So I'm, I'm well hooked up with, uh, with company swag. That's, that was a, a good start to that. Uh, hosted my, my grandmother's uh, memorial service. Thanks again to everyone who sent in kind thoughts and words uh, during that time. That all went off mostly without a hitch. Uh, I, I, I will say, no, nah, I won't even tell the story. I'll tell you offline, Sean. There's a good, there's a good story okay. uh, tied right. to this. Wow, everyone's, everyone's so disappointed right now. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's, it's not so good that I feel obligated to share it. I think okay. if I didn't know my dad was actively listening to this mm. podcast from time to time, uh, and to be clear, nothing about any, anything with my close family or it, just it was one comment someone made at the end of the, after the service during the open mic section. <laughs> anyway... I'm not going to get into it, even though I okay. mostly got into it. Yeah, not getting into it. Uh, amidst all of this, uh, Abby and I had been looking at open houses and eh, decided we throw in our first offer on a house. It's a competitive market. We figured, eh, it's not going to happen. Well, we got outbid. We weren't the high offer on this house, but the offer we had was structured in such a way that it was uh, cleaner and had uh, a team they were more familiar with. So they ended up picking our offer wow. one for one. So we are buying a house. We're buying a house in beautiful Kings Highway Hills here in St. Louis, Missouri. So at least for the near future, Sean, this is where we're at. Wow. Well, yeah. it's okay. So hold on. I'm just going to, I'm going to relate this to board games. So does that mean everything that you've learned from auction games is wrong? It's not the highest bid that wins. <laughs> it's the cleanest so, bid. Sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> Well, like sometimes in, in some of these games where you're you're offered something for something, it's not like a, a Castles of Mad King Ludwig structure. You know, it's a free formed structure. Where I can offer you something. Someone else can offer you something. You mean like nothing personal? Yeah, I mean exactly like nothing <laughs> personal. Uh, so much like in nothing personal, uh, <laughs> you can you can have the higher <laughs> offer and it doesn't go through. Um, <laughs> boy, that game. So can we? So can we agree? That the painful gaming moments that you have, quote unquote, enjoyed with me has has made you a more shrewd negotiator in the in real life. I don't I don't <laughs> I, I, I like I think I'm sort of halfway kind of decent at negotiating. Okay. I'm probably just terrible at it. Like, I'm probably not that good. I, I had this big like, yeah, I went to China. I negotiated for stuff in stores like I got stuff from the market for cheap. And I and I have to imagine in 90 percent of those cases, I absolutely did not get the best deal I could have gotten or anywhere close. So I think I'm probably not a very good negotiator, Sean. OK, regardless, regardless, we're getting a new house is the bottom line. Three bedroom, two bath, has a basement, a uh, good amount of space, uh, two car garage. Uh, and a lovely home in St. Louis. So that's the big breaking news for me. Are you going to have a dedicated recording space? So I, I will have an office. There's an office space right off of the master bedroom. It's on the second floor, uh, looks out over the street. And yeah, I fully anticipate using that as, as the recording space. I don't know if it'll be fully dedicated. In other words, I don't know if I'll add a bunch of noise canceling stuff, but the acoustics will probably be a little bit better just based on the size of that room. So yeah, audio quality may very well improve with this move. I don't know, Sean. All right. Yeah. Hey, do you have your heat on where you're at? Yes. Okay. Well, you, you just have a big puffy, like, winter coat on. So it's I, just... I'm like in... So, so St. Louis has been abysmally cold this week. Uh, from, from Monday on, 
it's been sub 20s most of the time, which for here is pretty cold. This weekend, we're getting like highs of eight or nine, lows in the negatives, which might have happened a couple times since I've been here, but is not a common thing. And I know anyone who's up in Minnesota or Canada or whatever else is laughing uh, because that's, you know, laughably warm, relatively speaking, for them for a winter. But man, oh man, has it been icy cold. So I'm kind of halfway in between, Sean. I am uh, sort of sweaty, but also sort of cold. So I kind of want to take this jacket off, and I kind of don't. Okay. So I might take it off midway through, but but for the moment, yeah, all puffy jacketed up. Speaking of that, our mm-hmm. buddy Berkey, uh, sponsor of the show through through Game Toppers. Yes. Uh, Rory was ordering some Game Toppers from Berkey for the for Empire Board Game Library. And Berkey was telling him how he was smoking some sausage out in the Minnesota, Minnesota, Berkey, I mean, Minnesota. That, yes. 100%. Yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. I couldn't remember. For some reason, I was thinking anyway. Uh, and, and it's like been below zero or was he even saying negative 20? No, it was like below zero, whatever for like the last 20 days or something like that. So, so much so that he couldn't even get his smoker above 170 degrees. Uh, cause you need to be like, you know, 225, 250 range. Uh, I, you know, I'm kind of an expert now with my electric smoker, oh, boy. um, but no, he does the real, the real deal, but yeah. So that's, that's pretty wild. But anyway, what's, um, that's exciting, Alex. It's exciting stuff. I'm very excited for you. Lots of changes and, and I'm excited to see you finally start to put some roots down or somewhere, roots. somewhere, somewhere you were just like flotsam on the ocean waves. I think that's the first time I've ever used the word flotsam. I'm not going to, really? I'm not going to, oh, I've used, I've used it before. You've used flotsam. Am I even, yeah. use, I'm using it correctly, right? I'm pretty sure I, I am. Yeah, pretty much. Flotsam and jetsam and all sorts of floating, uh, untethered ocean bits. Yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Good for yeah. me. No, well, good job, Sean. Let's talk about some board games, Alex, or things that are board game adjacent, at least. <laughs> In <laughs> your case. Why don't you start us <laughs> off? Well, and, and I was going to talk about this in terms of planning roots, Sean. This is, this is sort of more belongs in news. Uh, there, there have been a couple of like funky news items that have happened. Not the like uh, the awful, terrible, oh my goodness, the board game community has some trash people in it kind of news, Ugh. which, I mean, there have been such a buildup of those stories since the last time we've had a news segment. It would take us the entire episode to break things down, but just, you know, don't be a jerk. Be, be, be better to people. I'll just say that broadly speaking. Um, there's some more substantive news. Uh, Sean, recently, uh, what, Asmodee just scooped up yeah. Board Game Arena. I'm curious how that, you know, this is not a mm-hmm. new segment, but it kind of is. But how are you feeling about that? I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, you know, I have concerns whether or not they're going to keep the existing catalog. Um, I, would assume, I would assume the answer is yes. Um, as far as what games get added in the future, is it going to be limited to Asmodee games? I, I don't know. Um, board game, board game arena has been my preferred online gaming platform for, for years. I mean, I've, I've been a, uh, a premium member for, for a long time, even though I haven't played a game on BGA in probably at least two months, but still I've, I've been on there for at least six years. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't want to be chicken little sky is falling, but it's certainly a little, a little concerning. I certainly have my my arms crossed looking at this closely. I, I I think it's more likely than not it ends up being a negative thing rather than a positive thing. But right. it, it's also too early to really say. I I am currently a premium member. I have not played a lot recently because I've just I just don't care about playing board games online. I don't. Yeah. I've emphasized this before. I just it's just not for me at this moment. At this moment, there it, there are little bits of it that'll come in. I'll talk about it in a bit. But it's just. I just want to play stuff at the table again on a consistent basis. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I should note, Sean, to that, to that end, another bit of news tied into this, completely throwing out the book. But as you said, don't be a slave to the format, right? It's, it's, sure. uh, it's a pandemic. Uh, <laughs> Geekway to the West got moved. And it got moved uh, from its normal springtime uh, to more in the fall. I think it's in October or September. I think it's October, though. Mm. And the, the big news with this one, Sean, isn't just that it moved in terms of months, but it moved in terms of days of the week. Oh. So they, in rebooking it, in order for them to avoid losing a, a ton of money, they needed to have some kind of event this year. So instead of a typical convention timing of Thursday through Sunday or Friday through Sunday, 
Geekway to the West this year, the main Geekway to the West, at last check, I haven't seen any updates since, and I don't think it's likely to, to have any updates, will be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Whoa. Yep. Wow. Same venue, same everything. Tuesday, Wednesday, Wow. Thursday. Yeah. It's rough. It's That's, real rough. Yeah. I mean, either you're taking an extra long vacation to St. Louis. Basically, mm -hmm. you're taking off a whole week of work if you're from out of town. Or you're doing... I, I don't know what you would be doing because... Oh, it's brutal. It's Alex, brutal. I will not be coming to Geekway no. in 2021. Are you sure? Yep. Totally positive. Oh, man. Oh, wow. Like, that, like, think about that. Like, that's, you're taking a travel day potentially on Monday and Friday, right? So, yeah. wow. No, you, wow. You, would, you would have to take off. I mean, basically, you could have a very long stay in St. Louis. Like, you get there Saturday, you know, go see the Arch, maybe go check out the river. Uh, go to the city museum, do the, do the, the somewhat, somewhat touristy things. But then you also have Sunday and Monday. And there's, there's, I, I love this town. I love this town enough where I bought a house. It's not, it's not a tourist Mecca. This is not, this is not a, a major tourist destination over here. So uh, I feel so bad for Geekway. They, I, I, they know that this is not ideal. This is not them yeah. being oblivious to it. They didn't have an option. They, if sure. they needed to have an event or else they were out, I think their entire deposit or something along those, like it just would not have been financially sustainable for them to do anything else, but it's brutal. It's really brutal. So anyway, mm. those are two, two bits of news in, in and amidst talking about games, mainly because I wanted to avoid talking about this game. I, I, I have it on here, Sean. I, I backed a Kickstarter. I, I've, I've backed, you know, some Kickstarters from time to time, but uh, I backed Next Goal Wins from OB Games. Looks oh yeah, super cool. Looks super cool. Uh, I I think I may have even talked about this on the show, but uh, soccer soccer related card game, uh, the beautiful game now in your hands for two to six players, and it shipped. It got here. It took a little bit longer than some other folks, but you know it it made it in one piece. It's a good looking box. I I I got what I pledged for, and uh, went and played the game with Abby, and mm, it looks so good on paper, Sean. <laughs> oh, it looks sure. so good on paper. And in practice, it, it just, mm. how this one works is you have, you have four players. You have a striker, midfielder, defender, and a goalkeeper. And you're going to draft uh, these players. And by draft, they mean effectively draw a card from a deck uh, and then pick other decks to draw from it. They call it a drafting mechanic. As best I can tell from the rules, there's no real draft to it. You kind of draw and manage your team as you go through the various matches. Um, there are event cards which have wildly swingy things like instant goals and whatever else. Uh, but these cards themselves at their core have uh, different stats. You know, stats in passing, crossing, dribbling, shooting, heading, um, interceptions, blocking, tackling, saving, catching, all sorts of sports-related skills. Uh, and they're thematically named. The art is really cool. They have different abilities. Uh, the problem with this game, Sean... So, uh, the, the way it plays fundamentally is you're going to choose a skill to test against someone else's skill, and then you both roll a die. The choice is only in choosing what skill to pick. Like, there's no tactical decisions I can make as a defender. There's no interesting decisions I can make in as an attacker. I'm either going to try and dribble past you and roll the dice then, or I'm going to send it way downfield, or I'm going to do something else. But there's only a limited number of options and decisions. And then the die rolls, and whatever the die rolls is what you get. It's kind of left up to fate. There aren't there are some tactic cards. There are some other modifiers or things you can do, but not a lot. It's not a huge part of the game. And the trick is some of these abilities in combination are just straight broken. Uh, like one of them allows you to, uh, if you're the striker, you can receive any of these long passes without a die roll. So typically speaking, like you're going to roll a die until the ball's turned over. And when the ball's turned over, now it's my turn to attack. In the case of this one, literally all Abby had to do was be like, and they pass and it's successful. And then they shoot. Mm. So you avoid one or two different die rolls where you could have lost the ball and just instantly get a shot on goal. I happened to get unlucky, and this was kind of funny, where my goalkeeper got a red card, fouled out of the game, so you're forced to replace them with not a backup goalkeeper, but with someone, like, someone else just at random from hand. Uh, and I guess you could have had a goalkeeper in hand. I didn't happen to, so maybe that's on me. In any case, then that turned into she not only got to pass it upfield, it was effectively an instant goal. She had like a plus four advantage between the two dice. I would have to be within four 
to even have a chance at saving the ball. Um, and she, she whooped me, but she didn't have fun whooping me. Like, this was one where we both played it and we're like, this is, this is dumb. This game is dumb. And I like a good dumb sports game. We have uh, uh, NHL Icebreaker, which is a good dumb sports game. It's basically a deck of cards with NHL logos on it and a board. But it's dumb fun. This is just kind of dumb. And I'm really bummed about it because it's uh, really nice art, decently produced. Rulebook is a complete mess. And the game itself is lackluster. So that's next goal wins from OB Games. Uh, I don't think it's super available anyway, but I would not go seek it out if you're one of the uh, sports game kind of fans like I am. All right. Over to you, Sean. Okay. Let me look at my list of board games I've been playing recently. Oh, my goodness. It's completely empty, Alex. Completely empty. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, I've been saying it. You've been saying it. I'm, I'm just struggling with playing board games online. I really am. Other than the, the once a day diplomacy that I've been playing with, with buddies uh, that I mentioned. But other than that, it's been, it's been really hard. It's been hard to even, you know, get games played here at the house with just me and Raquel. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a couple video games. The first is something that I've been resistant to for a while. And, and I went back to our guild, uh, Scott Neelitz, Neelitz, <clears throat> Scott Neelitz, there we go, posted this in our guild on October 9th, 2020. And I thought, I feel like he just posted this. Um, and it's titled Legends of Runeterra, better than Magic Arena, Magic the Gathering Arena, first mention. Um, so Legends of Runeterra is an online CCG collectible card game that is, has some, you know, inspiration for Magic, uh, both Magic Paper, Magic Arena, also a little bit of Hearthstone, which is the World of Warcraft card game. and. So, so I saw this, I read his, you know, I read his, uh, the rest of his post. He says, um, let's see, a Twitch streamer that I followed started playing Legends of Runeterra and it has been a breath of fresh air for this jaded card game player. It's a lot less predatory. That's important. A lot more interactive, works well on both mobile and computer. I don't even want to try it on mobile because that would just be bad. I, that's, I have way too much to, to do during the day. Uh, features more card tweaks through frequent patches to fix problem areas. And in general, each game feels like it's more competitive. I rarely go away from a game feeling bad for losing. Okay. So I, I read this. There, there's some more here. And generally I was like, eh, yeah, okay. I'm sure it's fine. Uh, I enjoyed Hearthstone. Hearthstone was a good game. I played it for a couple months, several years ago. I enjoyed it, but it didn't quite scratch the itch that, um, that Magic did. And so recently I watched a video from one of my favorite magic YouTube content creators. Uh, it's called Tolarian Community College, which is a play. There's a, there's a, uh, in magic history and there's a magic card called Tolarian, uh, Tolarian College, Tolarian Academy, Tolarian Academy. There we go. And it's the super busted card. It's banned in a bunch of formats. So he has a site called T Tolarian Community College. And keep in mind, he's like 95% magic content. He had a video where he had a guest on and they compared the economies of Magic Arena and Legends of Runeterra. And the economy for Legends of Runeterra, Runeterra is far and away superior to Magic Arena. Um, like Scott said, it is far less predatory. Uh, it's, I mean, I mean, to build a top tier deck in Magic Arena, like if you want to jump in and build a top tier deck, it's going to be four or 500 bucks. Now that can be, that can be, not even spread out over time, but over time you can just free roll stuff and eventually build up to that. But it's going to take quite a long time. Legends of Runeterra, it's like 40 bucks for a top tier deck. If you want to just pay the money to get it rather than grind to get the various resources you need. There's wild cards. There's these things called shards, which can be used to, to build cards. So it's, it's really interesting. And I've been playing it for a little over a week now. It's, you know, it's free to play. You can invest a little bit of money in. I did put 20 bucks in and I'm playing a tier two deck because it's a combo deck and I really like combo. Shocker. So, so let me tell you a little bit about how Legends of Runeterra plays. So this is a, a dual game where you're trying to reduce uh, the enemy's nexus or their life total from 20 to zero. And you're doing that by summoning heroes and followers 
which are basically creatures for magic. Um, and you're using them to attack the enemy's nexus. And when you attack the enemy's nexus, your opponent has an opportunity to block with their creatures. Um, notable differences in magic, you can double or triple block. In other words, I can use two or three blockers to team up on one of your attackers. In this game, you can only ever do one-on-one -on -one blocks. One of the things that this game takes from Hearthstone, which is which many people kind of see as an improvement on the land system and magic, which is your your resource base and magic, is you generate um, are they called gems? You you generate one uh, one mana, whatever you want to call it, one energy every round. It increases each round. So round one, you and I both have one mana. Round two, we both have two. Round three, we have three, etc. But if you don't use any, you're able to store that for subsequent turns up to a maximum of three. However, th that stored mana can only be used to play spell cards. It can't be used to play heroes or followers. So a little, little bit of a restriction there. So yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's pretty much it. You know, you play creatures out, you play, you play, uh, you know, cards out of nowhere at instant speed. They're called bursts for combat tricks. There are, there are other cards that are played at a slower speed or sorcery speed in terms of magic uh, that are called, uh, they're, they're slow spells. Um, there's, there's fast spells, which is kind of something in between. Um, and, and it's pretty straightforward in a lot of ways, but what's interesting with the deck building is instead of colors like you have in magic or instead of, um, classes like you have in, in Hearthstone, you have different regions of this world. Uh, so there's like Demacia and I think Nox, Noxus, um, and that's your pool. You can combine two different regions and then you can build your deck from cards from those regions. You have these heroes, which are the top tier um, of, of the cert of the cards in your deck. And what's interesting is they're double-sided. So once you play this hero out, any other instances of the hero that are in your hand or that you draw, while that hero is already in play, they flip to a spell side that's specific to that particular hero, which is pretty interesting. It's kind of solving some issues of, uh, in Magic, if you have legendary creatures, you can only ever have one legendary creature with of that card in play at a time. And if it's if you have that card in your hand, it's dead. So you can't really do anything with it, although you could replace it if it dies, whatever. Um, it's been really fun. I've been playing every day. I'm spending a little bit of time every day grinding in Magic Arena, which I normally do, and grinding in Legends of Runeterra, which, I've, I, which has been really interesting. And it's very possible that um, through this grinding process, you can, you can have um, the full set of all of the cards available in Legends of Runeterra. There's, there's um, a competitive scene to it. There's all, all sorts of stuff. And what, what was interesting too that Scott mentioned is that the game, you, you, can, you can patch cards. So if a card is busted upon release and they get the data and they're like, yeah, this card's overpowered, in Magic, that card gets banned. They can't patch it. Even though there's a digital version they can't do that in paper form necessarily. And so, so a card just gets banned. Um, here, they can fix it. They can tweak the cost or they can tweak part of the effect um, and any number of things. So I'm really enjoying this. And Scott, I apologize for, for being, I guess, dismissive. Um, everything you said is 100% true. And I am glad that I've started playing it. I, I, think, I think it has a little bit more legs to it for me than Hearthstone did. Hearthstone is like, stupid popular still, um, but it never really caught on for me. Um, oh, and, and interestingly enough, Legends of Runeterra is based off the League of Legends world, which I've played a little bit, but haven't been super crazy about. Um, whereas World of Warcraft, or sorry, Hearthstone, I had played a ton of World of Warcraft. So you would think that the tie, the, the, the thematic tie would be greater for Hearthstone than for Legends of Runeterra, but whatever. So... Did your eyes just glaze over, Alex? Yeah, oh yeah, very much so. Okay, well, that's fine. Hopefully that's not quite the same for at least some of our listeners. No, I, I, as we've established through the survey a long time ago, uh, there, mm. there are far more Sean listeners than Alex listeners. Yeah, but this, is, this, this CCG aspect, I think, is, is a smaller slice of the pie for some of our listeners. So it's something that I enjoy. Like, see, playing CCGs is something that I have been doing since I was... 10, 11 years old, and it's something I will continue to be doing probably for the rest of my life. I mean, even in paper, I've been playing Flesh and Blood, which is amazing. 
I, there's just something about these CCG games or even, even LCGs um, that just, it, uh, it just resonates so much with me. It's just something I enjoy so much and learning a game and, and getting better at a game and understanding, like being able to anticipate, like knowing the meta game and what, oh, this player just played this particular card. Therefore, they must be playing this kind of deck. I need to adjust my play accordingly. Like knowing those things is just, oh, it's so, it's so great. Talking about feeling clever. That's what CCGs is, have always made me feel, I think. Yeah. So, that's all fair. right, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Look, Legends of Terra. Having played some more Slay the Spire, I feel like that, that combinatorial aspect of things yeah. is, more, is, a, is more of a thing I could enjoy now. But okay. it's always felt way over my head. And I'm sure I would still get my butt destroyed at building a, a good magic deck or something like that. But I feel like I have a better sense for that kind of a game now. So it's yeah. possible I'd enjoy it more. It's possible. It's a skill, it's a skill that you hone and you build on and, it, and you know, it takes time. And so, but anyway, yeah. All yeah. Right. I'm done. Well, next one I'll talk about, Sean, is one that I played online. And I know I was bashing online games earlier, but, but this was a good experience. This was Three Sisters. I played it with BJ from Board Game Gumbo, as well as the name father, Steve O'Rourke. And the Three Sisters uh, refers to uh, basically a, a, a farming technique where you would have, uh, in, in complementary nature, corn, beans, and squash. The idea being the corn uh, itself uh, serves as a kind of a trellis or a framework for the beans to wrap around, and then the beans provide something that deals with the soil. Da, 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 da. Everything feeds <laughs> off of each other. It's a, be oh, it's a whole beautiful cycle of life. I don't understand it. Uh, I mean, I, I probably do understand it, but, you know, I don't. Uh, <laughs> this, the game is based on that concept. So it's a gardening game. It's done by uh, Ben Riddle and... Oh. Or sorry, no, I messed it up. Ben, ben Pinchback ben and Pinchback Matt Riddle. Ben Pinchback and Matt Riddle. Yeah, okay. my bad. I mean, maybe, maybe together they could be called Ben Riddle. It's fine. Uh, no, but the, the, these are designers, if you haven't heard of them. Uh, they, they're, they're known for uh, Fleet, Fleet Dice Game, uh, Stellar, a favorite of Abby and, and mine. Uh, they've also done Wasteland Express Delivery Service, uh, among many other games. Big, big this, fans of them as, as designers. Absolutely. Yeah, they, they do good work. Uh, I haven't played all their games, but I've enjoyed what I've played. So, this is a game that I believe is coming to Kickstarter later this year. Uh, Beth Sobel, one of the artists on it. So some, mm. some good names associated wow. with this one. Yeah. 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 So this is a roll and write game, and this is one of the uh, uh, kind of deeper, more advanced roll and writes, but not to the level that, uh, that Roman roll was trying to do. This is uh, more in the vein of something like, uh, this was compared by BJ frequently, Fleet the Dice Game. If you've played okay. Fleet the Dice Game, this is in that kind of vein. Solid so, game. Yeah, a solid game. Uh, this one, also, you have multiple score sheets, uh, at least based on playing it online. And you have uh, your field, which has six different zones, and it has beans, uh, corn, and, uh, and pumpkins, basically representing the squash. And, oh, and sorry, I'm reading the description online. So the beans bring in nitrogen from the air into the soil, and then the squash provides a natural mulch to help reduce weeds and keep pests away. So there you go. That's how they all work together. That was nothing like you described initially. Whatever. <laughs> I don't need you. I don't need your criticism. Um, in any case, you have that area of the board, uh, each represented by different numbers. You also have uh, uh, perennial flowers, effectively. Uh, you also have fruit and flowers. You have a shed with a bunch of tools that can unlock special abilities. Uh, you, th this game has a lot of different tracks, and it's sort of one of those also gone shown clever things where I get this thing, which gets me this thing, which gets me that thing, which gets me this thing type of deal. Um, how this works is you are, uh, uh, at the start of a round, you're going to roll a, roll a set of dice. There's a rondelle where sort of the main person sits, and the dice are then spread out across several actions. Those actions could include things like shed time, where you would get um, to check off one of the shed actions, or it could include... Uh, fruit or uh, fruit or bees, or it could include uh, taking a rain action, or it could include getting uh, certain certain money, like different kinds of currency in the game. There's all sorts of different things you can get. Uh, when it's your turn, you are going to draft one of these dice. You'll get the value of the die, and then you'll also get the action for wherever the die was. So the value of the die, you can choose to either plant a certain amount of seeds within an area, or you can choose to rain on all of your crops in the area which makes them all grow one level. Uh, you're looking to, uh, as, as you complete different crops, you'll get points for that. 
Uh, beans have to, you have to wait until you've grown the corn a certain height in order to use them. Pumpkins, once you fill them up, they'll get you uh, usually some sort of uh, one-time uh, uh, currency that you can spend. Uh, also, if they're next to each other, you'll get perennial actions. Basically, there's a bunch of things that trigger off of other things. Whatever die is left over after everyone picks their die, all of the players get. And then there's a special bonus action each round that occurs. Uh, so it might rain for everyone in, in, uh, across all crops. You might, everyone might get a shed action. Uh, and your shed has different things you can do that, that will improve your actions elsewhere. That's a very non-specific description of the game, but, but effectively it's a, it's a roll and write with a lot of these different layers. And these layers all work really well together. I enjoyed this play. Uh, I, str I, I would recommend keeping an eye on this one when it's, when it's on Kickstarter. Uh, I may back this one myself. Uh, I certainly enjoyed it. It's another solid one from, from Ben Pinchback and Matt Riddle, also known as Ben Riddle. So there you go, three sisters, Sean. Yeah, that sounds that sounds interesting. All right, so you know, on one hand, I feel I feel bad like for being so critical of you, uh -huh. but but I mean, it is this is this is what we got, right? This is this is the dynamic, right? So yeah. your 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 jacket's off, the puffy jacket's off. Yeah, it's been off. Yeah, it's been off for a bit. Now. Okay, and then as you were describing three sisters, you were waving around what appears to be your COVID mask. Oh. Uh, I have, I have a number of different masks, but yeah, there happened to be a mask nearby. I wasn't even, I didn't you, even realize I was doing you, that. You had it in your hand, just waving about all of the particles <laughs> that are on the outside of the mask are now just dispersed into the air around you. So here's the thing. <laughs> I work from home and this is a mask. I haven't actually like, okay. this is a clean mask. This Good. mask is fine. It just Good. happened to be sitting on the table. So there's no particulate being flung into the air, Sean. Uh, it's just a mask. I didn't even realize I was doing it. I'm going to throw this in the, oh, I missed. I was going to try and throw it in the masket, but it just landed on the floor instead. Oh, well. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's I three apologize. sisters. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, I don't think you, I don't think you really do. You're not it's too, fine. you're not too chilly now, right? You're good? No, I, for now I'm fine. I might put the jacket back on though. Okay. Let me know. Yeah, let me know. I mean, I'll, I'll know. I'll see. Well, it. you'll see. I'll yeah. let, sorry. I'll let the listeners know if the Thank jacket you. comes back Very on. important. Yeah. Sean, what else have you been playing board game wise? This is a bit of a board game, Alex. It just happens to be in a digital form. Oh, okay. So uh, I saw, so Mandy from, uh, from the Dice Tower, I saw her post about a game that she's been playing on Switch. And I guess she's also playing on PC too with other people. It's called For the King. And you have not heard about this because I mentioned it to you before we recorded. I haven't heard of it. This is a roguelite, not roguelike with a K, but roguelite with a T. Um, RPG role playing game where the uh, it's a fantasy realm. The king has mysteriously died, and the queen has tasked three adventurers to figure stuff out. I don't know, whatever. Um, so you can play this solo, you can play this with other people, but you're controlling these three adventurers. And there's different there's different classes. There's I think he's called the scholar, or he or she, whatever. It's called the scholar, which is kind of a wizard. Um, there's a ranger type character. There's a blacksmith, which is barbarian ish, I suppose. And you're going to take turns with each of these, uh, each of these characters and in, in succession, and they have a certain movement point allowance. There's, there's this, this map, a uh, hex map, and you're moving about, there are random encounters that might spring up, but then there's also quests that you have to complete. Uh, you have to go to this neighboring town and pick up a vial of whatever and then bring it back and you get some sort of some sort of reward. Um, there's also obviously monsters to fight, and you may encounter a monster in the the fields, whatever, and you have choices. You can say, well, I'm gonna ambush this monster. And by ambushing this monster, if you succeed on a on a die roll check, um, you're going to be able to fight that monster one-on-one. -on -one. Or if the rest of your party is within a certain number of hexes of you, you can all team up on that one monster. But if you fail the ambush or just choose to fight, that monster is going to pull in any other number of monsters that are also within a certain number of, of hexes. So it's, it's pretty interesting. You've got your typical, you know, D and D stats. You've got your, your strength and your perception, et cetera. Although they call them slightly different things. Um, but it's it's there. And basically the the underlying nuts and bolts of the game are you're making D one hundred D one hundred rolls, although you don't actually see it. So so like in combat, for example, depending on the weapon that you're using, um, this particular weapon might might give you an option 
deal 15 damage to this creature. That's that's if you're successful on say three rolls, right? So, and it's using, it's a bow. So it's using, using my perception. I forget what it's called. It's uh, awareness or something like that. Um, and my awareness is 77. So I'm basically making three D100 rolls. And if I roll 77 or less, then each one of those hit. If they all three hit, um, then then I'm doing the 15 damage. If only two of them hit, I'm doing 10 damage or so. And then if they all hit, I might get some bonus for it being perfect. Or maybe there's a critical that can that can get rolled. I'm not, I haven't figured out what triggers a critical yet. Um, but then there's other things you can do, like you can you you have focus, you have a certain number of focus that you can spend and then you can get back after resting. A focus gives you a guaranteed successful die roll. And so it just kind of increases the the chance of what you're able to do. Um, it's it's really cool. I mean, this feels like a board game. This feels like um like Mage Knight or something. And ultimately, your your the quests are getting harder and harder. You're you're delving into these small dungeons and these bigger dungeons. Um, and the dungeons are interesting because you're going through wave after wave after wave of usually two or three monsters, and then there's some big reward at the end. But ultimately, be prepared to die. I think I spent four hours of gameplay before you before you die. So it's it's a little bit longer than a typical run in a rogue light or a rogue like game. Um, and so I've only, I've only had the one run so far. This was probably three days worth of playing. It was probably closer to five hours actually. And it's really cool. I mean, you're, you're getting new gear and upgrading gear and uh, selling stuff off. And it's, it's really good. I, I highly recommend this game. I'm, I'm, ah, it's good. So if, if you like RPGs, like, like board game RPGs, uh, or even regular RPGs, I don't know. It's it's really good. Um, the dice rolling, it's it's mathy, crunchy. It's it's really good. I think you will, I think you will enjoy this quite a bit, Alex. I really do. I'm watching the gameplay. Uh huh. The one thing that sticks out to me is is the art doesn't wow me. It's low poly. It's a low poly yeah. uh, art style. Uh, yeah, I know. It's a, it's a clearly a stylistic choice. Like it's not yeah. intentionally low low grade. I you know what I mean. It's it, low it's poly. Just, yeah, it's low poly, and I don't know. It's not, it's it's not striking me as something I enjoy a ton. But so I mean, have you played like have you played old RPGs like video game RPGs like like the old? I mean, I, I mean, I haven't played Final Fan like any of the newer Final Fantasies. I played like Final Fantasy like one and two. Oh, see, see, I I have briefly played Final Fantasy seven. Uh, I've played some other of the the kind of RPG esque type games. So I've played things like this before not extensively but yeah i mean i think you have to enjoy these kind of turn-based games um which some people may not like i don't know you know it it's it's something i was like i'll give it a shot it was i think it was 10 bucks on steam or 15 bucks on steam and and i decided to give it a shot and i'm really happy i did I, i think it was really solid it the first night i played for like an hour and they don't really tell you how the the system works mm, necessarily okay. like, they tell you how to play they, sh- they give you a t- tutorial tell you how to play but they don't really tell you about the nuts and bolts and so i kind of just had to figure that out over time and that's when i really enjoyed it was when i understood the nuts and bolts of of the mechanics okay interesting so, it's got a 77 on metacritic so not 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 terrible at all yeah interesting. so yeah that is for the king definitely check it out i'm excited to start another run well that is a and a look at both the games we've played and the news all in one bundle after the break our review of alma mater well we've talked a lot the last couple episodes about the freedom 5 kickstarter that was up from our friends over at arcanewonders.com and shucks wouldn't you know it, the campaign is over. A very successful campaign. They had almost a million dollars in pledges, $944,247. Oh my goodness, that's so much money. Now, don't fret though, because if you didn't back in time, you can still do a late pledge. You can get the Citizen Pledge for $49. You can do the Hero Pledge, which is for the Kickstarter Exclusive Edition for $109. 
So head on over to freedom5game.com. That's freedom5, F-I-V-E, game.com. That'll send you over to their late pledge site where you can take a look at all the different options for getting in a late pledge. Uh, not sure how long this is going to be up and running for, so I would say hurry, act now. Definitely check it out. That's freedom5game.com. Additionally, check out all of Arcane Wonders' other awesome titles at arcanewonders.com. All right, go check it out. Sean. <laughs> Why do all of our ads have to stop, <laughs> or start rather? Why do all of our ads have to start with one of us saying the other person's name? Alex, do people not know what they're listening to? And do they not recognize how distinct your voice is from my voice? Well, Alex, I think that we're completely distinct as human beings and individuals. I agree. For example, Sean, which is which is you, not me, you have a very lovely game topper, do you not? I do, in fact, Alex, have a wonderful game topper. I enjoy it so very much. Uh, it, it's something where I don't have to have a, a full-on, all-purpose, all-the-time game table. I can have a game table when I want a game table and have a normal table when I don't want a game table. So, Sean, I hear that, <laughs> well, well, shoot, the Kickstarter's over, right? The Kickstarter's been over for, like, what, six months? How on earth can I get my own Game Topper, Sean? Well, Alex, it turns out it's not too late. You can go to Game Topper's website at GameToppersLLC.com, and there are still some toppers you can get. Some of the packages have already sold out, but there's still some things out there. Uh, you get a Baker Street bundle. You can get some of their amazing thematic game mats. Sean, I, I got a little secret for you. Is it? Is the secret... Uh, Wait, is, is no, this, Alex. Alex, I have a secret, secret for Sean, you. Based on this fact that our buddy Berkey is a very industrious fellow... It is, in fact, Alex, that our friend Perky is a very industrious fellow. And keep your keep your ears peeled, Alex. There's another Kickstarter coming later in 2021. Should I keep them peeled or should I keep my ears to the ground? You should keep them somewhere where they're going to be able to hear this news. Okay, fair enough. Well, if you want to learn more about Game Toppers and the awesome products that they have, you should head on over to GameToppersLLC.com. It's always a showstopper when you're playing on a Game Topper. It has been a rough time to be a student these days with graduation ceremonies, uh, getting done in a socially distanced fashion, school from home, parents at their wits end. So why not get a taste of the old school college life? back with sprawling campuses and deep discussions. But is alma mater itself deep and interesting, or is it deep and unintelligible? We'll tell you. Alma mater, it's the dawn of a new age in Europe. During the early 15th century, universities are being established to challenge the influence of religion on academic studies. Little did the founders of these institutions know that this would ignite academic pursuits that would bring about a cultural revolution. So Alma Mater is published and developed by Egert Spiel. It's designed by Antonio Tinto, Flaminia Brassini, Virgenio Gili, and Stefano Luperto. We've got art direction by Sophie Gravel with illustration uh, by Chris Quilliams and graphic design by Stefan Vachon. So Alma Mater, at its heart, is a worker placement Euro game where you're trying to get the most victory points. Oh, I mean prestige points, Alex. Excuse me. Prestige points. That's, that's important. So you're, you're taking on the role of a chancellor of one of these competing universities, and you are trying to recruit new professors you're trying to attract students, and you're trying to increase uh, what you know, what your university knows on the research track, as well as meeting certain requirements in the Hall of Fame. So the game is going to be played over six rounds. There is a central board, which has all of the different worker placements points, spots, such as the campus where you will recruit students, the academy where you will recruit teachers. Um, there's a spot for that research track. 
And then there are some other spots. There's the antiquarian, the laboratory, the park, the bishop, and the colloquium, for example. Um, and they all do, obviously, di different things. You also have your own player boards, and these are double-layered player boards with some inset spaces. At the top, you have your display where you're going to insert certain bookshelves, which you're going to hold these little chunky plastic books that I had to resist trying to eat because they just look so delicious. Below that, you have two different um, lecture halls. And in these lecture halls, this is where you're going to recruit your students. Your player board also has a holding space for your workers, or they're called masters in this game. And then there is a end game scoring uh, that is at the bottom of the board to just keep that in mind as, you know, you're trying to play this game and actually try and win it. So when a round begins, you're going to start with the action phase. So this is just your worker placement phase. You're going to place workers and get immediate actions. Now, instead of placing a worker, you can also instead give a lecture as a full action. And if you want to give a lecture, you will have needed to have already recruited a, uh, a professor, and then you can tap it or turn it sideways. There's a certain cost you have to pay, and one of the main resources are books, and you'll have to pay a certain color of book to use that professor, and then there's some sort of immediate effect that happens. All right. But otherwise, most of the game is you placing out workers. So you're going to do that, complete a round, uh, then there's some sort of cleanup things that will happen, and then you go on to the next round. So let me talk a little bit about the resources in this game. I mentioned books. Books are the primary resource, but then there's also money. The books come in different colors. You have colors for each of the player colors. Then you also have these special yellow books, or uh, they're called dictionaries in the game. And a lot of the actions in the game, uh, recruiting students, and uh, recruiting professors require you to pay some amount of books. Now, what's nice is you can get your color of books pretty easily. You have a worker placement spot on your, on your board that allows you to pay up to $6 to get six books from the supply of your color. So your books are easy to come by. Other players' books are a little bit more difficult to come by, as are the yellow dictionaries. So I should point out, when you get your color books, you have to choose to either take them into your personal supply or to place them on your bookshelf from, from right to left. Um, because what's going to happen is someone else can buy your books. They buy them left to right. There's a certain action spot that you'll go to. And then they have to pay you based on the number of, uh, of coins that's shown above that particular book. Again, they have to buy left to right. Uh, so the more books you have that are, that are spreading out to the left, the cheaper they are. And then the farther they get to the right, the more expensive they are. So the cheapest they'll be, uh, is $2. The most expensive they'll be is $4. So that's the primary way you're going to get books from, from other players' colors is to buy books from them, meaning the money is going directly to them, not to the bank. So that's something you definitely have to look out for because maybe you really need someone's particular color of book, but are you going to help them too much by giving them money when maybe they're, they're cash poor? So it's really important to understand kind of this flow of books because, again, uh, while money is important, the books are kind of the main commodity of the game. So let's talk about some of the action spots, the worker placement spots. I talked about that academy, and there are different types of teachers and different types of students. There are mathematics uh, teachers and students. There are um, uh, medical, medicine, medicine. There's law, and then there's art and music. And what's interesting is the art and music teachers are harder to come by, whereas the art and music students are easier to come by. And, and basically, the, 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 the cost of each flips, right? So, so similarly speaking, the, uh, the math teachers are the cheapest, whereas the math students are the most expensive. I'm yeah. not sure exactly what the commentary is there but I, I, I find it interesting. I find it interesting. So if you want to buy a particular type of professor, uh, there's, there's two, different, uh, two different professors for each, uh, each of those subjects. Uh, you have to spend some amount of money and then some amount of books. And it'll kind of tell you there. Um, so like, for example, the cheapest you can get, the math teachers, they cost you five bucks 
and then two books of one color, one book of a different color, and one book of yet a third color. Now, what's really interesting is, Alex, if you want to buy that same professor, you're not going to have that money cost. That's gone. Instead, you have to pay the book cost exactly as I said it. So by going first, I have to pay more money, but I get to choose which books I use to fulfill those requirements, whereas I've now locked that in for you to use. Um, and you actually place books on this kind of track next to the professor, which is, which is pretty interesting. As far as going to the different students, the students are uh, in, in four rows where you have one of each type, uh, one of each subject, and then there's, uh, there's four columns as well. And so you place in a particular row for the worker placement, and then you choose which of the types of students you want, paying again, certain number of books. As the game goes on, there's going to be a book reputation track change, which is really weird. It's kind of hard to explain. But basically, the value of books, in a sense, will fluctuate throughout the game. And so, for example, in the first row, you have to use books that are of reputation one or two, the highest two reputations. Um, and then for the next cost of that, it could be something else. Uh, it has to be a different color. So it's, it's an interesting, interesting little fluctuation. Uh, I mentioned the other spaces. There's the antiquarian where you can buy uh, any color of book plus any color, or sorry, plus um, a yellow dictionary. You have different options of increasing price. The, the more you pay, the more you get. There is the laboratory, which is going to let you increase on the research track. I'm going to come back to the research track, but you can either uh, at the laboratory increase three times paying the full cost, or you can increase once for free without paying any costs. There's the park, which lets you turn 10 bucks into seven prestige. There's the bishop, which lets you place any number of workers, one, two, or three, to get a certain amount of increasing money. And that's also going to affect um, the turn order for the subsequent round. And then there's the colloquium, which is the action that lets you um, either buy dictionaries or buy books from other players' shelves. So I should point out that most of the spots in the game are semi-exclusive, meaning that if I place on the park with one worker, Alex, you can still place on the park, but you have to place two workers instead. Always have to place an increasing number of workers. Whereas the bishop for money and turn order and the colloquium for buying books from shelves, those you can place multiple times without having to worry about that, that special rule. All right, so let's... I mentioned the research track. Let's talk about the research track. It is basically these five cards that are going to be different every game. And there are um, basically four levels for each. And as you ascend up them, when you reach the top of a card, you've reached a milestone, which gives you an immediate effect. It could be money. It could be points. It could be a, a free action. Um, but if you want to ascend on this research track, you either need to pay for it or you need to get those free um, increased research actions. And sometimes they'll say, okay, pay a certain amount of money, or it might say, just have three students and you just automatically qualify. You don't have to give them up. But why this is really important is this is what sets the reputation level of the book colors at the end of round. And it's probably kind of hard to over or easy to overlook, I should say, at first, how important that is. Because if, if your book is of type one, especially, that is, that is harder to come by for other players, but it's easier to come by for you. And you're going to have a much easier time paying for the costs of, of the students. So it's, it's really important. And I think to, to ignore it is, uh, is at your detriment. So kind of taking a step back, I, I mentioned the professors can give you some sort of um, once per round ability tapping them. You want the students because they will give you um, usually some sort of immediate effect and also sometimes an ongoing effect. Additionally, these are all worth end game scoring points. So for example, the professors have printed points on them. Uh, the students, uh, the math students do have some sort of end game scoring based on how many other teachers you have or how many students you have. But more importantly, you are placing them in your A row lecture hall and your B row lecture hall. Um, one above the other, and you place them in a zigzag pattern. At the end of the game, you're going to multiply the number of A students times the number of B students. That's going to be some points. Um, 
wherever you end up on the book reputation track is going to give you some points. There's also these busts, <laughs> which uh, give you special abilities. And usually there's some, I know you're shaking your head. Like, I know, Alex, I know this is crazy. Uh, there's certain prerequisites if you meet and they're pretty difficult to meet. You're going to get access to these busts, which give you access to these chancellor special abilities. The more busts you have, the more points you're going to get at the end of the game. Plus, the chancellors give you game-breaking abilities. By the way, at the start of the game, you're going to draft some chancellors. You're also going to draft <laughs> some starter player resource cards. <laughs> and, Bo, did I mention, Alex, oh. that at the end of a round, when you're getting income, um, you're going to get money for every book that's in your bookshelf, but then you're going to take the leftmost bookshelf off and you're going to slide the rest of them from right to left and add your extra bookshelf to the beginning, potentially losing books. I'm, I'm missing at least eight more things, right? I've got to be. Yeah, there's a couple more. It's fine. <laughs> this is all to say there is a ton going on here, an absolute ton of learning. I'm just looking. I'm, oh, oh, there's a thing where you can change the, the value of the books that you're that people can buy from you, which by the way is representing the exchange of knowledge, I suppose. Sure. Why not? All right. That's, that's what I got, Alex. That's how you play. By the way, most prestige points wins. If, if that wasn't, wasn't perfectly clear. All right, Alex, alma mater. What were your initial expectations for this game? Did I, is that, is that good? Is that Sean, good? I, sh sh <laughs> by, by the way, I will say uh, among there are many jobs that I'm glad I don't do on this show. I've I've taken on some additional responsibilities from the beginning, uh, but but uh, coming up with these long rules explanations is is not one of them. And sometimes I think eh, it's not too bad. You know, handful of rules I can talk through. I can teach a game. I've got I've got the chops for that. And then there's weeks like this one and this game where I'm like I want no part of this. No. I want no part of explaining this. You did fine, Sean. Though though I will say I got distracted by something which I'll bring up during final thoughts and rating. Uh, I got distracted by something completely different. Okay. I spent the drive home like, oh my goodness, how am I going to go over this rules explanation? Like, how? How? And I was yeah. going well, through it in my head and... Uh, you did fine. Anyway. You did thank fine. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, Sean, uh, I was uh, hanging with my friend Josh and uh, we had some margaritas and... No, Shut I, I did. Oh my God. No, I did. I, did. I absolutely played this game. I haven't seen Josh in a while. Uh, he's, he's been in very COVID safe as, as a lot of my friends have been. Uh, so I have not seen Josh of late. I did in fact play this game. Uh, luckily enough, uh, it was my buddy Patrick in town. We played, we did a masked, masked game day. Oh, we played, we played during that a game. I forgot to talk about. I'll have to talk about it next episode. A game called element, which was awesome. Had a ton of fun oh. with element. Uh, in any case, I, that, yeah. that's more for next week. If I remember, uh, no. So we, we, I did not have Abby go through this one no and i'm glad i didn't because no. i yeah. oof -a doof -a. uh so we we i did get in a play of this sean a play one <laughs> one singular play and for reasons that will become clear that was enough oh sorry expectations before i played uh expectations were pretty good because this is a solid design team and i loved coimbra uh yeah. i've and i've heard good things about lorenzo de medici so you know, I figured this thing might have a lot of stuff going on, but it might come together pretty well. Coimbra is not the simplest game, but man, is it good. It's a really good game. So I had good expectations for this. But I've already kind of given away the, the ghost a little bit in terms of some thoughts on this one, Sean. What were your ex expectations? So, so high. Um, because you're right. This is, this is a great design team. Um, I loved Coimbra. I loved Lorenzo Il Magnifico, Alex. Although there ah. also Simone Luciani was on that as well. So there's, it's not, it's not the exact same team, but, but enough. Uh, yeah, no, I was very excited for this. I actually picked this up from empire. I, I purchased this outright, um, as opposed to payment plan, I guess that's weird. Um, but I purchased this months ago and it sat on my shelf of shame for a while, just cause Raquel and I have. She, so when, when Raquel wants to play a game, she wants to play something that is a tried and true favorite. For the most part and she's definitely a good sport for for helping me get through these these review games but for the most part until this was on our radar as a review game it just sat there and and you know i was very excited for this and i had my expectations were were high yeah i think with the design pedigree 
Absolutely. I think I had high expectations. The, the, the theme wasn't necessarily something I was excited about. It was something that reminded me a bit of Newton and I liked Newton quite a bit, but I wasn't sure. I don't know. So yeah, high expectations. Rules. How did you learn this game, Sean? Uh, I read it. I read the rules and I, I sat there, I punched everything out and I set up the game and the setup was rough. Re- setting up the game from the rule book uh, was, was not easy. There were things that were not, were, were not quite described clearly. The way that they labeled the, the board and reference like, okay, step one. And then here's a little one on the board. There were, there were labels that were like covering the game board. And so you weren't quite sure. Um, the, the, there are certain red sections that are broken out, which are, I, I'm not sure how it differentiates from the other rules. And then there's blue set blue sections, which are examples. Um, and it was, it was, it was a rough learn from the rule book. Um, it's another one of those 12 by 12 rule books where broken up into columns, but it's just text, 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 text. Um, additionally, it was hard to reference certain things. I could not, for the life of me, figure out what the dormitory was on your player board. So you have your archive, which is where you keep your workers. And then there's a dormitory which is a spot beneath it where that has a worker on its side with a little Z, 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 Z. And I'm like, does that mean? I know what that I, is. Well, I know, well, I know what it is now, but it, in my first play, I was like, so does that mean when I get a worker, it comes into the dormitory and I can't use it right away? Cause that was sort of the implication. I spent forever finding it. And, and finally I found it. it's on page five. Um, it talks about additional masters, but it was nowhere um, I, I expected to see, because it does a good job of showing the game symbols. And so I was scanning the rule book looking for the extra worker symbol and I couldn't find it. Or even the the Z symbol, the worker, or the, sorry, the master Z symbol. Um, eventually, I did learn in a subsequent game that there are certain effects or actions that have you, as a cost, move active active masters to the dormitory. So, but it was... It was weird. I don't know. I wasn't crazy about the rule book. Um, so, yeah. Sean, I, let me know if I missed this. And it's possible I did. I didn't see it in player setup. I didn't see it in game setup. I saw it sort of implied in, th- in two-player setup. But how are the shelves supposed to start on there? Is there a set <laughs> order that they're supposed to start? Is there not a set order? Do you just load them up? So, is it, okay. is it explained somewhere? So... It is. So when you say a set order, um, what I didn't mention in the rules is that each of your bookshelves, and there are there are seven bookshelves, and you'll have six in your display at a time. They each have a point value, a prestige point value. It, it's one, 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 two, two, three. And when a player buys a book from you, they get to flip over your shelf face down, and they score the point. So there's some incentive for for people to buy books from you, especially if you know they're going to buy it from that juicy three. Um, so it does, sp- it does say you put them in any order you want. It does say, okay. that. however, I should also point out that, and quarantine caveat for myself, I only play this at two players. Um, and so there is a dummy player that you use, you use that player board. There's a, in, in, uh, in Dom, in Domo stick. What's it, what's it called? Uh, it is called the Ig- Ig- Ignotus. Ignotus. Yeah. Igno- Ignotus. Ignotus cards. Um, and it, and it sends some of the work, some of their workers out immediately to clog up some of the spots. It moves them up the research track, and then it tells you how many books to add to their um, to their display, their bookcases. And for them, it has you spe- set it up in a specific way, but not but not the regular players. You can set it up however you want. And I kind of did not like that because you sit there and you're like, there was probably a best way to do this. I don't want to figure out what the best way to do this is. Why don't they just have us set it up in a certain way? There, that could be the way to describe so much of this game. This is, <laughs> okay. this is, this is probably important. This is probably significant and impactful. I don't intuitively know what it is. 
I don't know how I could possibly know without multiple, multiple, multiple plays of this why mm-hmm. this is, you know, for instance, the adjusting prices on your bookshelf. You can make them lower, you can make them higher. Uh, I guess you make them low enough, more people would be incentivized to buy more of your books. Right. But you don't get victory points when people flip over your bookshelves. So I don't know why that would be an incentive. I don't know why you wouldn't want to just have the prices as high as possible. And, oh, you're, you, you need to get this because you need to get this. I guess you got to pay a lot of money. Sorry about it. I, right. I, 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 think it's, I think that's more useful in a higher player count game. Could be. Could, could be, but there's rules within rules. Like you can't break the order of increasing value uh, from left to right on the shelf with those things. Uh, there's, so I, I watched a rules video. I read the rule book. I watched a video, another video. I read the rule book and I fumbled, fumbled, fumbled and stumbled my way through this because it wasn't one of those games where after having watched the rules and read it, there wasn't this moment where things just clicked in my mind in terms of here's what I'm trying to do. Here's how I'm going to get points for doing it. Here's, here's some routes I could go that are maybe easy. Here's some routes that are trickier. It might take some finagling. Like, the, it just was, I don't know, make some moves and, and maybe you'll figure this out. And midway through the game, maybe by round three or four, I started, it started to cement in my mind. But this was a rough one, Sean. This was a rough setup, a rough teach. The rule book is, is not as clear as I would have wanted it to be. Uh, it has a nice reference section, I suppose, but... yeah. I, I, ugh, this was not fun in any form or fashion to, to learn. Not for me anyway. So would you, w- so, so you are, you are less of a princess in the pea than you were years ago. Yep. Do you think, do you think having been taught this by someone who had known and previously played the game would have possibly affected your uh, enjoyment of it? it? It could have helped probably okay. would have helped. Because I certainly don't generally like teaching games of this length. I, right. I'm okay teaching games, but this is a... I mean, when you add in setup and some of the different little nuanced steps in setup and, and just the magnitude of the setup, plus the explanation, I mean, you're talking easily 45 minutes before you're playing on a first play. Yeah, that's probably fair. That's probably fair. Yeah, there's, there's a ton of setup here. I, I mean, there really is. And even... Um, I mean, even having to put in the bookshelves and, and then draft the, the starting, uh, the starting cards, it's kind of like Zolkin, how Zolkin does it, where it gives you four tiles and in Zolkin, it gives you four tiles and you keep two here. You're given four cards and then you draft them and then you pick three of them to keep. Um, and then you have to draft the starting chancellors and then the third chancellor becomes the, the a chancellor. There's an a, B and C chancellor that you can get the bus for. Um, yeah, there's there was certainly there was certainly a lot going on here. And I I knew from the beginning because a lot of times, you know, you're like I know how to play, I just don't know why I want to take any particular action. And I I did make sure to figure that out before before we took our first turns. I'm like, "Okay, I think I see what we're trying to get at here. Um and you're going to have to spend a significant number of turns investing in either Cause you're going to start the game either with a lot of money or with a lot of books or whatever. And, and I made sure to kind of give Raquel, I'm like, okay, here's what I think we're trying to do. Um, you're not going to be able to do a whole bunch in one round. You're going to spend, especially that first round, maybe getting a bunch of books that you need or whatever. Um, and so I think that that helped. I think, I think that can help in any sort of medium to medium heavy Euro game where it's not just enough to know how to play, but it's why are these moves important? And I think if you, if, and I've certainly done this where I just rush right in and then I f- realize halfway through the game, oh, okay. But I, I took a little bit of time. I sat there before Raquel ever sat down for me to teach her and I kind of thought through all of the levers of the game. And I think that helped. Uh, I, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll throw in another one here too, Sean. Uh, another, another question. Bef- because it's explicit that book values aren't set based on the research track until after the first round. Right. How do you buy a student in that first round? What, what's the price you pay or how do you pay that price? So again, after the first round, you have reputation values. You have right. you know, one, two, three, or four, depending on how many players you have. And so one student, might, one student column might say, you need to spend two books of level one and then one book of level two or three, and then one book of something else. Um, we said you could spend whatever you want. Okay. Is that in the rule book? And I, think it, I, I think it's in the rule book. 
Okay. I, again, I may just be a big idiot who didn't see it, but I, I thought I looked, thought I looked pretty well. I'm sure you'll find it. But it just was a, you, did you find it? I seem to remember, maybe. Here's what I never found an answer to, even after looking on BGG. <laughs> so on the top of the player board, by your display, your bookshelves, there is a little symbol that says, um, what does it say? It says like minus four gold. I know what this one is. Okay, what is that? That's, you can, if, even if someone's sold out of books, you can buy a book of their color for four gold anyway. Oh. That one, is, that one I found in the rules. I could not find that. I could not find that. It was that. somewhere in there. Yeah. At one point, I thought maybe it meant that as an instant action, <laughs> you could spend $4 to remove one of your books from your shelf into your supply because you desperately needed one. Oh, that's, interesting. So, and I should point out that's a rule. Once you've put one of your color books on your shelf or in your personal supply, uh, that, that decision is made when you first acquire those books. Yeah, they can't, you can't move. change that later. later. Right. And I thought maybe that's what that was about, but I couldn't find an answer and we didn't obviously play that. We just ignored it because we're like, I don't know what that means. Um, but actually in our first game, that would have helped Raquel because I was the first player in the last round and I made sure to, to be that so I could buy out the dummy player's books. Okay. Dang it, that, that would have helped her. But so that's the thing. There, there are a lot of these moments like that where I realized around later, oh, we played that wrong. Yeah. Oops. And, and look, mistakes will happen, but this was just sure. such a, a thoroughly frustrating experience for me. And I felt bad for Patrick having played it. He was very nice. He was very kind about the whole thing. But, oof. Oh, it was rough. <laughs> oh, it was rough, Sean. Yeah. Uh, Hey, let's, let's move on to art and components. This is, I think, the area where I'm going to be most complimentary of the game. Sure. Because the, the, the book tokens themselves, super cool. Components, all of a high quality. Multi-layered player boards. I love multi-layered player boards. Great. Uh, the iconography for as complicated of a game as this was, to me, was not the problem for the most part. Yeah. Uh, it, it did as good of a job as you could do, and I felt so bad for the graphic designer of this game because there was so much that needed to be communicated in different ways, in different settings. And for the most part, they came up with a language that made sense. Agreed. Uh, so, you know, it looks fine. It looks really busy on the table, I guess. I, I liked Chris Quilliam's art style. Uh, I thought the game's presentation was well done, and I think that presentation had the game... I, I think it raised the expectations for the game a little bit in my mind. You know, oh, this, this game looks super cool. Hey, it's got a functional insert that holds everything uh, for the most part in a logical way. Th this, this game does so much right on the production side of things. I, I don't know, Sean, is there anything I'm missing in terms of quality of this? It felt like a, a really high quality production to me. No, I agree. Even, even the books are these little plastic books. They're, they're decent size. They're chunky. They've got the, the player color on the outside and then little little ridged white you know, for the paper inside. No, I think, I think the production is, is really strong. Art design's really strong. Um, no, I, I, think it's, I think it's a solid production. And I, and I agree with you. I think that the iconography is also really clear. Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, certainly we had, to, we had to run down initially some of the different professors, but once, once you picked up on the language, it was pretty, it was pretty straightforward. And we didn't, after our first play, I don't recall, I don't recall ever really looking at the last couple pages, which are the, the appendices that tell you what they do. There was probably one where there was a question. Oh, there was a question of, of order. So everyone starts the game with a built-in student. And then there's a, another student that kind of duplicates the ability, but it's a little bit better. And it's a worker placement spot that lets you buy your own color book and then also lets you pay for a, a bump on the research track. But the way it's, the way it's listed, the, the research track gear is above the worker placement spot and above the pay to get books. And so we weren't sure if it got resolved top to bottom or if it's in the order of your choice. And, and it did clear that up. 
but I think my my initial inclination was yeah, it's top to it's top to bottom. Um, even though that that's not the case, it appeared to be do it whatever order you want. But wasn't yeah. quite clear. So yeah, not perfect. But there were so many other things that were bugging me about this that this was not the problem. And if anything, it was it was the positive side of it. Uh, again, I, I want to compliment the insert was was really well done. I should note, Sean, it, it is interesting though those those yellow books. I, I think they're called the th- the sources. There's another name for them. Dictionaries. Dictionaries. Uh, they look functionally the same, but the rule book also makes clear you can't use dictionaries where textbooks would be used and vice versa. So they're also pretty limited in how you can use them, I guess. Yeah. And they look the same. So that element of things led to some amount of confusion. And I I am sure I played something slightly wrong as a result. Uh, I don't know. It was a mess. It was a mess. So, so Alex. Yes. Did Uh you notice anything about the the professors and the students. Uh, I have a guess as to where you might be going, but not, not that I noticed in the moment. Um, so I, I had been told this by Rory months ago and I, and I had forgotten it. And then I, I realized it as I was setting up the game and it just, it, it just kind of jumped out at me. What was it? Just all, just all white people. Ah, <laughs> like, and and what's interesting, and and, and okay, so there are those that will say, well, it's Europe, and you know, historically accurate, blah blah blah. Um, but but it does a good job of having both men and women students and teachers, even though I don't think that's historically accurate. Kind of pick and choose, huh? Yeah, it it was it was weird. It was certainly weird so i didn't notice it but it didn't improve my impression of the game just doing that now (laughs) yeah so oof uh well oof indeed oof uh on the gameplay sean yeah sean so i i ended up with a score in this game that was i think a reasonable score I think if okay. I, if I recall correctly, it was, I think it was like upper, upper sixties, low seventies, um, probably, okay. you know, it wasn't a winning score. I lost by a few points, but it felt like about the range you should be in for the most of the game though. You're kind of scr- scraping by, at least in my plays of this to get a clear 15, which gets you another worker. And then you just sort of rack up points towards the very end. Uh, does that sound about right to you? Like, this is one of those plays where I played through and I was like, I feel like someone who knows what they're doing could get a lot more points probably. But this feels also reasonable based on the actions you have. Some, something just felt kind of off. So I don't know if that number sounds approximately right to you. So my first game, I had like 85-ish. Okay. Mid to low 80s. Raquel, had, and, I, and, and again, quarantine caveat, I only got two plays of this in. Um, That's double the number I got. <laughs> um, and she got like low 70s. And then second game, I was high 70s and she was uh, high 60s. I mean, I think, number one, I, I definitely think knowing which gears and levers to twist and pull and what order to do that is important. I think it's going to depend on your chancellors. I think it's going to depend on, you know, what professors are out. Like, I definitely think there are pools of, of random pieces that will affect affect those scores so i think that's definitely part of it so i think it's hard to to look at my scores compare them to your scores with with not having the same set of of pieces to start the game with probably okay yeah that's fair i it just it was one of those where the game was so baffling in the early rounds for me that it had mm-hmm. us both wondering have we done this remotely right is this where we should end up and seeing Seeing the scores eventually end up there, some, some amount of reassurance, and hearing from you, some amount of reassurance. But it is also, and, and I felt this way with Next Goal Wins, which I talked about early in the episode, where you kind of consult back on the rulebook and you think in your head, I mean, the rulebook says this is how you're supposed to play it. Is that right? I, I guess it's what the rulebook says. Let me check again. Nope, it is what the rulebook says. Like, 
there were just so many moments in this game of just it did not feel like it flowed or was intuitive in really any way during my play of this. And I, I will tell you this, Sean. I have a feeling that if I were to play this more, it would click in more. Mm -hmm. There would be layers that would unfold. But to get to that, the center of that Tootsie Roll pop uh, is not worth the licks. So I just... Mm. I feel like I don't have a ton to say about this because it just, it just ultimately was such a, a mess to learn and such a slog to set up, and it didn't click in any real way until a few rounds in. That it, it just, I didn't enjoy this, Sean. I just didn't enjoy mm. the play of this. And I love Coimbra. Like, I, yeah. I've, I've really enjoyed some, and I've heard great things about Lorenzo, even if I got the name wrong. Um, <laughs> I've heard great things about Lorenzo. <laughs> but, oh, this was such a mess. And it's such a shame because, it's a, again, it's a gorgeous production. It looks great. A good design team, clearly, but... I don't know what it was about this, Sean. I, I don't even know if I have anything intelligent to say about why this fell so flat. I don't know if it was just the barrier to entry. Uh, I don't know if it was just feeling like an idiot half the time. I, I don't know what it was, but it just did not come together in a way where I can see the depth and I'm intrigued by it. It came together in a way where I can tell there's probably some depth here, but man, this is no fun. Uh, I, it seems like you yeah. had a better experience than I did. I'm not surprised by that, but no, yeah, I I enjoyed it um, a decent amount, a, a fair amount. I, I would say that ultimately it didn't it didn't wow me as much as Coimbra did. Uh, Coimbra is a very solid five, if I remember correctly. What we what we scored, but even remembering plays of it, it's 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 a great game. Lorenzo Il Magnifico, which has half the design team, is a six. I mean, Raquel and I, that's one of that's one of her favorite games, one of my favorite, you know, midweight uh Euro games. And there were, you know, I, I think first, this is one of those types of games where your um your starting asymmetric power wants to point you in a particular direction, right? And if you um if you can spend some time looking at the board, identifying what path you want to try and take, obviously limited by what players do to block you on certain spaces or whatever. Like, so for, so for example, in, uh, in my second game, I had the chancellor that said, if you want to activate your, your professors, you don't have to spend a book to do that. Very strong ability. They're all, they're all strong abilities. Although, eh, there were some that just seemed to be strictly better, some that seemed to be situationally better. Um, but basically, in a typical, typical play, if you have a professor, uh, when you first recruit him, you get to use him for free. Uh, in subsequent turns, you have to spend a book to use him. And that color of book is defined when you initially recruit him as the, uh, the most books of one color. That's the color you put on him to indicate that's the color you have to spend in future rounds. So certainly, um, I was trying to go a very heavy professor route, but then I also noticed, hey, there's a student out that gives me some other benefit whenever I recruit a, a professor. Um, and so that's something that I want to kind of keep an eye on. And so I felt like there's a lot of strategy in the game in the sense of, I want to play to my chancellor. Um, and so I, I definitely felt like I had planned out at least the first two rounds from the, from the get-go, knowing I'm going to have to take some time to stop and get some money. I'm going to have to take some time to, you know, get certain books. Um, do I want to sacrifice, uh, do I want to sacrifice turn order knowing that I may not be able to get to the cheaper books of the dummy player than, than my opponent will. So there was, I mean, there was a lot that I, that I enjoyed here. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't great. It wasn't bad. It wasn't just, it, I wouldn't say it was just okay. I think it was good, but I think I'd, I'd gravitate first towards, um, first towards Coimbra if I want this design team, the straight up design team. Cause I think it's, I think it's all four of them. I think, or if I want kind of a Renaissance, uh, Renaissance Euro game. I'm going to go to Newton. Newton is fantastic. 
So there was certainly a lot I liked here. There were certainly a lot of opportunities to, to feel clever, a lot of, a lot of combos. What, what's interesting is, man, this dummy player, I, I liked the dummy player in two players because it was really easy. It was, it was place out the three workers, um, move up the, the, the research track, and then add the books out. Very simple, very straightforward. There's a lot of Atoma, um, you know, solo play or, or, or dummy player play where it's really complicated and you have to like, it's hard to remember and you have to check things. This was really straightforward. It didn't bug me. Um, I didn't mind every now and then having to place out two workers instead of one. For whatever reason, it ticked Raquel off. Like she was so frustrated by the dummy player, um, partly because the dummy player places out all three of their workers at once. By the way, you have four workers, masters, um, and the dummy player only has three. But still, um, I, I don't know. She found it. She found it super, super frustrating. And overall, she was not a fan of this game. Um, I mean, really, really not at all. She said she'd play it. She played again. Um, but she wasn't crazy about it. She's more in your camp, Alex. So, so Sean, I was looking back at Coinbridge just to kind of refresh my memory, and it wasn't oh. all four of them. It was, uh, it was a couple of them. But the okay. thing I loved about Coinbridge was you had so much in this one dice drafting decision, mm -hmm. such a, 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 so many layers in that one very clear, very simple mechanically, but very deep decision. Which color die do I pick? Which number can I afford this? Which row do I place this in? Um, what card am I going for? There's so much there. And there were different routes. You could try and run around the board a bit more. You could try and build up money. There were just different ways you could go about things. And that game was brilliant and a ton of fun to play. But at its core, it had one mechanic you could hook your hat on. With this one, what is that mechanic? Is it the value of books? Is it the book market with other players? Is it... I don't know. There isn't one compelling thing that I can kind of hook onto. There's a lot of things, and, and it's, it doesn't feel derivative necessarily. It, it feels different, but it feels different in an overly complicated, overblown kind of way. So I don't know if that, if that makes sense, Sean, that, that it, it does. doesn't have that one compelling centerpiece. It does, and I, and I think, yeah, I think I would agree with you, Alex. Um, and, and, and when I say that, again, the takeaway here is I still enjoyed my plays of it. And I will probably enjoy playing this a couple more times. But that's probably going to be it. That's probably going to be it. And that's, and that's okay. That's all right. I've, I've rented this game, essentially, uh, for, for a couple plays. And that's, that could be worthwhile sometimes. Sean, it's interesting. Because I, I, we'll get to Guild Thoughts here momentarily. But I saw the rating for this on BGG. And I was baffled. This thing's got a solid, really solid 7.7. 7. That's a very good score for a game on the number of ratings this game has. Uh, that's, yeah, 825 ratings, 7.7, 7, solid. Not mind-blowing, right? You're not talking top 100 all time, but that's, a, that's mm -hmm. a decent score. Yeah. I don't understand. I don't understand it. I, I don't understand it. Anyway. Real quick, I'm just looking. So, so this was a 2020 game. I'm just looking where it's at rank wise. It's 1628. Yeah. Okay. Eh, I mean, yeah, too, I think not anything, too high. I think yeah, not too high. Um, yeah, theme wise, I, I I don't know. It it wasn't particularly thematic. I don't think. I, I can't think of anything. Even like the research track. <sighs> No, I, I just, I, I didn't feel like I was the chancellor of a university. Um, no, no, nothing, nothing about this felt thematic. I mean, you're, I mean, really and, and truly maybe, the, well, maybe the only thing was again, <laughs> something about how certain types of students are easier to acquire, but that same, that same subject of teachers is easier i don't know i don't know what commentary is there or if it was just a design decision to to flip them i don't um, know like almost like hey if you are an art master if you are art or musical master that that can be a professor you are you are the highest caliber 
Um, but an art student's a dime a dozen or something like that. I don't know. I don't think that's, and I don't know how that would, um, so the math students are harder to get, but the math professors are cheaper to get. I don't know what that means. Once you decide to study math, you realize your only career path is to become a professor. <laughs> Maybe. I think that's unlikely. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I think you're giving the game too. I didn't even, didn't even strike me. And it, it may make sense if I, if I really stretched and thought about it. Um, I, look, the, the, the art and components give this game some thematic liveliness. But, I mean, Coimbra, for as, as wonderful as Coimbra was, theme was not a strong suit. No. Theme was not why you played that game. And I don't think that was the aim here either, to have a, a richly thematic experience. Sure. It, the game looks the part. It doesn't necessarily feel the part. It doesn't, not, it doesn't feel athematic to me necessarily, but it's just, it's certainly not a strong point. There isn't a strong narrative to it. And, and not a problem. It's not that kind of game. So it, I, it's not really a critique. My bigger critique is on how dang hard it is to learn the thing. Uh, that's my that's my bigger bigger problem. Uh, in any case, Guild Thoughts, Sean. Adam Dalton says, Alma Mater... <laughs> Adam Dalton says, Alma Mater really fell flat for us, even trying it three or four different times. Just feels like work to play it and doesn't have the payoff we felt in Coimbra. The book-selling mechanism doesn't work as well in a two-player game as it likely does at a higher player count. The production, of course, is top-notch in the game and the art style with all that color, but I'm going to have to unleash the two... On this one. Yeah. All right. And then BJ from Board Game Gumbo says, Alma Mater is not like Lorenzo or Coimbra. By the way, I'm pretty sure we're pronouncing Coimbra incorrectly. I'm pretty sure someone corrected us and gave us the correct pronunciation. But I, I forget. It's just so ingrained in my brain at this point. No, I know. I know. And I, I forget what it was. But anyway, uh, we're the... Okay. So let me start over. Alma Mater is not like Lorenzo or Coimbra where the game was opaque during the first turn, but opened up like a student unraveling her study scroll to reveal exciting truths and knowledge. Games that spur you to set up the game again and play. No, Alma Mater felt as incomprehensible as walking into your 25-year college reunion, barely knowing anyone in a crowded room of aging people. Your best friend was supposed to show... He didn't. His son had an AAU basketball game and you sort of recognize the class president. But other than that, you're left wondering why you bother to show up at all. First impression. Ready for this, Alex? Mm. Two out of six because the book auction is central to the game and was completely uninteresting to me. But I am willing to give it a chance to see if it is more like Grand Austria, which has gone up for me on every play. So first off, your analogy, BJ, Oof. to to the uh, to the high school reunion. I feel like number one, I feel like that's very personal and, and very much what happened to you. But I feel like that's also what happened to me. I'm constantly seeing like people from my high school on Facebook, like suggested friends, and I'm like, I vaguely remember you, but I remember nothing about you. Like I have my very close friends from high school and college, but like there's so many people. I'm just like I I. Yeah, which is why I've never gone to any of my reunions. So I, I mean, I I fully expect I never will go to any of my reunions. I just didn't have a good college, like high school experience. Uh, so he he was talking about college reunion anyway. I'm I'm approaching my I'm approaching my 15 year. This is this is my 15 year high school reunion this year. Uh, so I'm still a ways away from from 25 for college, but I can imagine that experience would be uh, bizarre. Though I will say this, it just. BJ, I think BJ has a misunderstanding on our scale because he gives it a two out of six, but then says, I'm willing to give it a chance. Two means you're not going to play it again. I don't know how clear we can be on that. You're not going to play it again, BJ. If that's the case, it's a two. Otherwise, it's a three, but a low three. So I just, I don't know about well, your scoring there. But by the way, by the way, we should point out that we, oh, yeah, yeah, rate, yeah. we rate everything's here at the Dukes of Dice, except for one episode a couple weeks ago. On a six-point scale, uh, with a one being poorly designed but playable, not necessarily fun, six being an all-time favorite that's a contender for the top ten. Okay, anyway. Um, Alex, please continue yes. with our wonderful guilt thoughts. So, and this is the only comment that's kind of in contrast to this. Uh, it does not surprise, the source of it does not surprise me. So this came from Eugene from, from Empire. Uh, I thought it would be pretty bland, but I found myself pleasantly surprised by the game. It is opaque, and it isn't immediately apparent how important the price and sale of your books is to the game actually functioning well. I would give it an initial four and would like to play it again soon. 
Yeah. Eugene Eugene would understand this game off the oh, bat. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's, yeah. He's a smart dude. It, it, unsurprising to me. Uh, yeah. Sean, uh, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have you go first on on your on your score, and I have a little bit of tw- a twist for my score here. Okay, Jeez. I don't know what that means, but yeah, no. So so this is this is I think a a good. I was about to say very good, but no, I'm not gonna say very good. This was a good Euro game, and I enjoyed my plays of it. And there there may be one more play of this, two more plays of this, especially if things open up. I mean, there's, there is a handful of games that a bunch in our group have either played in isolation or played online. And, and I think there's going to be just this, this fury of activity once things open up a bit more to try and get everyone to get plays of, of in certain games. And I think this will probably be one of them. And I will certainly happily participate in, in teaching this to others, playing some more. I, I disagree with Eugene. I think there was a certain blandness to it. And I, again, I enjoyed it. There were moments that I felt clever. There were combos that I enjoyed. I enjoyed trying to, to steer my, my university based on my chancellor. There was a lot to like about this game, but I'm, I'm far less likely to, um, to pull this out over other games by, by some of these other designers on it. And while I'll be happy to play, like I said before, another game or two of this, that's probably it. And that's okay. That's fine. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to give this, Hmm. Hmm. You know what? I was prepared to give this a four. I think I was going to give it a four. A four is a good game worth playing just in all the time belongs in the duchy. And I don't know if I'm saying, yeah, I'm good with one or two more plays and then, eh, Certainly after those one or two plays, if years later someone's like, hey, do you want to play alma mater? And I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd consider it. Yeah, I, got, I think I could give it a three. It's going to be a high three, a very solid three. Um, game is okay. Wow. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm going to read three again. This is, now I'm struggling, Alex. Game is okay. Not exciting. We'll play in the right situation. And I don't know that I agree with that. I don't think it's just okay. I said before, it's a good game. It's not a very good game. It's not a great game. It's not a three. It's not a three. I'm going to stick with my guns initially. It's a four. A good game, worth playing, just not all the time, (laughs) belongs in the duchy for now. That's what it says. That's what it's always said. (laughs) It's always said that, Alex. You can't prove me wrong. You 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 don't have the receipts. Sean, you have a built-in double take three on this one. Like you have a you have a four here that is guaranteed to drop to a three. Yeah, yeah, you no, built you it may in. be right. Uh, you may be right. We, let's yeah, call this to, let's here, let's call this a fading four. <laughs> just to prove you wrong, I'm gonna play this once every two weeks. Okay. Now to the double oh, team. good. Oh, uh, please, please do so, Sean. <laughs> I'm a, I'm thrilled to hear how that goes because I think you would be paying a far far larger price than me for something like that. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you'll you'll find some sort of of uh, big underground community for this game. Maybe, uh, maybe. maybe. I don't know. Uh, I won't be in that community. Uh, so, Sean, <laughs> uh, my my score is not a surprise. It's it, this is a, a a very clear two on the scale. Uh, this is this is not a game I'm ever going to play again. It has some merit. I can see the merit, uh, but it has significant issues, including being just a, a a a pain to learn, a pain to set up, not a lot of fun. And just no central exciting piece. So, so what you were go- you were trying to do game, but you know, I'm not going to play you again. Not a chance. But Sean, while you were reading through the rules explanation, I got distracted, and uh, I found a Twitter thread from Elizabeth Sampot. I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, this is uh, she's a creative director for mobile games, and she was uh, having a bout of insomnia, and she came up with a bunch of chess variants. So, Sean, your goal is to tell me which of these chess variants you would rather play than this game. All right, ready? Okay. Hoppy chess. Knights now move like pawns. Pawns now move like knights. Would you rather play that or, or, or alma mater? Alma mater. Oh, I'd rather, I'd rather play that variant. That sounds super fun. Uh, suicide king. So the goal is to still checkmate your opponent's king, but also you control your opponent's king instead of your own. Alma mater. Oh, oh th- that variant for sure. 
Uh, this one's this one's kind of boring. Lifting chess. This is just chess, but the pieces are very heavy. Pawns weigh 10 pounds. Kings weigh 60. You can't take a piece unless you can lift it. You have to pick up your opponent's king to checkmate. Eh, that's just chess. Okay. So, I, alma mater, maybe. Uh, Howl's moving castle. King can swap places with either of his rooks at any time. No limit on frequency. Uh, alma mater. <laughs> Probably that variant. Uh, Chaos Chess. You choose a color king to defeat, but control all pieces of both colors on the right or left side of the board. This means when a piece travels to your opponent's half, they can use it. Still have to be opposite colors to take pieces, though. I, this, that one modern. confuses me. <laughs> I'm a modern. Uh, the American Dream. Any piece can be promoted when it reaches the opposite end of the board, except for kings. Is this one close? I'm a, no. <laughs> Wait. Okay, this, this one I found the most intriguing. Term limits. Every 10 moves, players must declare a new piece king. New kings maintain former movement rules, but are now pieces that must be checkmated. Alex, can I assume then yeah. that you have never played Nightmare Chess from Steve, Steve Jackson games? I have not played Nightmare Chess from Steve Jackson games. Okay. Well, then I think that explains why these all sound so interesting to you. Because, yeah, Nightmare Chess was a thing, and it was not great. Chubby Bunny. Every time you take a piece, you have to put it in your mouth. If it won't fit, you can't take it. <laughs> Alma mater, Alex. <laughs> Let's wrap up this review. Wait, I got one more. I got one oh more. Goodness. Trap door. Before the game, each player writes down a square on the board that has a secret trap door. Any piece that moves onto that square will automatically be captured Reveal the trap door for the first time any piece moves onto that square. The trap door remains active afterwards. That's a, I think that's a cool variant. Alma mater. All right, fair enough. Anyway, <laughs> that's going to do it for our review of Alma Mater. Sean gives it a fading four, and I'll give this one a two. You don't know. I do know. You are listening to the Dukes of Dice. Proud members of the Dice Tower Network. For other great shows in the network, check out Dicetowernetwork.com. Back to Alex and Sean for this week's Duke's Double Take. All right, for this week's Duke's Double Take, we're looking back at episode 218, Wolfgang Pack, where we reviewed Taverns of Tiefenthal. Sean, you gave this one a listen. What do we think at the time? Oh, really? I was about ready to be like, Alex, let me handle this. Because no, anytime... no, no, I, I was smarter this time. Because <laughs> anytime I do the, the, the re-listen and then you try and read my notes. It's, it's bad. It's, just, it's, it's a dumb bad. idea. Yeah. You thought this game was purple and then, uh, <laughs> and then silver triangle. You thought you'd, you thought you'd keep your copy of Alma Mater. All right. So, yeah, I gave this a three, Tavers of Tiefenthal. Uh, I would have given this a four if not for the setup. Um, and, and I think this was some, was this either before or after? Did this lead to the Goldrum scale in the well, next episode? Have. I don't I, know. I, I don't know. Um, and then I said, <laughs> there was a lack of meaningful decisions, at least consistently. Every now and then, yeah, okay, sure, why not? Um, and I said, I didn't feel the drama. Sure. I, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. There, there was a lot that I liked about this game, but I, I remember that I enjoyed it at first, my first play quite a bit. And then my enjoyment of it uh, came down quite a bit. It's kind of like, a, not really push your luck because this is a Wolfgang Warsh game. Um, this came out after uh, a year or so after Quacks of Quedlinburg, which is a true push your luck game. This one, uh, I don't know. All right. And then you, Alex, you gave it a four. You agreed that setup and breakdown was an absolute nightmare. But even with that being said, you and Abby both really enjoyed it. You said that the thematics came together with gameplay in such a way that it was satisfying, but not enough to necessarily make you want to play it again and again and again. You, you thought that it would stay in the collection and you would expect to play it a few more times in the year ahead. So Alex, question for you, was Taverns of Tiefenthal a fading four? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's gone. I, I have no idea where it is. I think, I think it might have gotten given away in some contest, or it's in the base. I have no idea where this game is. 
I, I'm not sure I necessarily care. I, I do remember some of the thematic enjoyment to the game, but yeah, it just mm-hmm. wasn't one that got to the table again. Maybe the setup breakdown was too much of a bear. Maybe it just didn't have anything interesting enough to make me want to pull it back out again. I'm not sure, but yeah, I, whatever the case is, it's a it's a clear three. Game's okay, not exciting. We'll play in the right situation. I'm sure I would play this again if someone had it set up on a table at a convention or whatever else and needed another person. Um, I, I, I would I would give it another try. But you know this 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 didn't deserve to be a four for sure, and and this uh, this episode that episode um, what was it two seventeen two seventeen two eighteen I believe two eighteen yeah two eighteen Wolf King pack that was where we also did the uh, the Dukes on deck nope Dukes double take there we go of of Quedlinburg oh yeah Quacks and Quedlinburg wow. And, and that game, man, uh, I, I think I'd given it a five originally and I listened to part of the, the double take and I, I bumped it back or I bumped it up to a six. Um, that's a game that I've played a bunch in the last, not a bunch, a couple times in the last year. I probably would have played it more if, if we'd been playing an empire. Um, but that's, that's just a fantastic game. And, and this just did not hold a candle. Taverns of Tiefenthal did not hold a candle to, to quacks from the same designer in any way, shape or form. So. Reflected in the Guild thoughts, by the way, mm-hmm. eh, somewhat. Uh, so Sylvain Lacroix says, one of the biggest disappointments in recent years. Hot designer, cool theme, but gameplay, so boring. The game is almost on autopilot all the time. No meaningful or interesting decisions to make, and I played with all the modules. It's sad because I wanted to like the game, but it ended up being a big flop for me. I rarely do this, but I unleash the two. Yeah, there you go. All right, and then Adam Dalton said, Taverns was a single play probably sometime around January 2020. My buddy Dave brought it over, said we just need to play with all the modules, and we did. My 10-year-old daughter joined us. I was very lukewarm on the game. I mean, I'd played again, but at the same time, I'd not seek it out like I seek out Quacks by the same designer. So on the Ducal scale, I think that fits perfectly in the three zone. Now, that said, my daughter has asked about it at least two different times in the past year, so perhaps I missed something myself and should seek another opportunity to play it with her. And I'd say absolutely do that, by all means. I think that sounds awesome. All right. Well, fair enough. (laughs) Sean, before we wrap things up, the best of the rest. Well, how about, wait, 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 wait. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Sorry. We got to give our, our updated scores. I thought I already did. Did you? No. Yeah, it's a three. Oh, oh, I didn't give my updated score. Yeah, no, yeah, right. you, you, you just yours. messed up. I don't blame that on me, man. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. Who's the one that moved on? You moved on. I mean, I did. A little premature. You did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I gave it a three initially. Game is okay. Not exciting. We'll play in the right situation. I'm going to keep it right there. It's, it's in no way am I going to leash the two on this game. I will play this game. Excuse me. Let me rephrase that. I would play this game again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would play this game again. Uh well, that's interesting. I, I will not die until I play this game again, and then I never play the game again, and I'm immortal. Um, it's going to be a three. Game is okay, not exciting. We'll play in the right situation. All right, that's it. I'm done. All right, very good. <laughs> That'll do it for the Dukes Double Take. Uh, stays at a three for Sean. Goes from a four to three for me. All right, now on to the best of the rest. And boy, there was uh, the rest were the best this week. Some really, really, really solid names, honestly. So just to be, so just to be clear, your, yeah. uh, your jacket's still off. Yes. Which is good because we're we're about to bring the fire here. Ooh, it's so be, it's gonna heat up. Way too hot. Yeah, it's gonna way heat too up. Hot. So uh Steve O'Rourke, the name father, kicking things off with tap and gown. Uh referencing cap and gown, but but switching that up for uh the the uh, tap in Taverns of Tiefenthal. I I should say this one would have been in the mix, but but one, we needed some easy criteria to just eliminate some of these really good ones. And two, because of how many episodes he's named, Steve has a a 10% disadvantage, and this was enough of a disadvantage to kind of take him out of the running. But really good name, Steve. Do you know I'm more inclined, Alex, when I see a TH in Tiefenthal and and other similar words to pronounce it as a hard T rather than than the the TH sound, the th? I mean, do we know... No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying, there's some other words too that I do that with. I can't, I, I don't know what those are. Anyway, not important. Um, okay. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering which is the correct pronunciation. I have no idea. I'm, I'm not saying name? it's. Oh my okay. goodness. <laughs> First time namer, Alex, 
breaking breaking their way into the top six. Hari Zafari. Oh, <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> that's so why I gave sorry. this one to you. Uh, I think it's Z- Zafari. Z- Zafiriadis? Zafiriadis. Zafiriadis. Yeah, that's Zaf- my, Well, there's, Sorry. there's an either. Zafiriadis? Zafiriadis. Oh, boy. Well, yeah. they're like, I'm never naming another episode of this stupid show. Yeah. Uh, suggested Kager. Just Kager, which makes sense because we're talking about higher institutions. Um, and then also the kegs from... Um, <laughs> from Averns of Tiefenthal or Tiefenthal. <laughs> which, whichever. Uh, oh yeah, and you ha- you would have kegers uh, at at your your college or university, not my college, but other colleges. H- Hari's gonna be disappointed because Hari's whole purpose of suggesting this name was they wanted to see a a one one word episode title. Just didn't Ooh. quite happen this week. Yeah, yeah, a little bit tricky. Good good name though for sure. I like I like that idea of a meta game though of of having certain criteria for episode titles. And that could be one of them. That's what we need now. We need we need like certain challenge. So so I'm, I'm, okay. Here's what I'm gonna I'm gonna try and remember to do this for the next episode, where okay. we will spoiler alert so folks can kind of consider early be reviewing Pan Am. Uh, so you know start getting those that ready. But I'm going to yeah. There's gonna be some sort of bonus challenge. Uh, it won't necessarily help you get picked as the naming naming uh, winner, but you just get extra credit if you if you incorporate this rule. And maybe we'll, in honor of Hari, have you if you can do this in one word, and have it be a really solid name, you get extra credit. So there you go. you'll get no, you'll get the Hari prize. Okay, I like it. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, every week we'll give out a Hari prize. Uh, oh, what have we committed ourselves to? I don't know about this. <laughs> anyway, uh, BJ from Board Game Gumbo came with parched for parchment, referencing uh, you know being parched, wanting a drink, and for parchment, wanting knowledge and a degree and to graduate nice, nice job bj yeah uh jimmy dm90 this one's very clever uh class half full class half full referencing you know the, the saying having a, a glass half full but of course we're we're throwing the class in there because of alma mater alex's favorite new game nope uh finally baker mitchell not with pomp and circumstance but hops and circumstance that was a good name. That was very I, good name. That was a very good name, Baker. Very good. There were some of these that, that just about any other week could have been the pick. It was a very strong week. So, yeah. Guild, you you brought the heat. You brought the heat. Uh, next episode, you've set the bar very high, and we're gonna need you to deliver again. So, let's keep that in mind. There's got to be some sort of. There's got to be some sort of. I don't know. Some some the, website the, that the can guild, help oh, hone. <laughs> Help hone people's naming episode skills, episode Maybe. naming skills. So, so I had two thoughts here. One, one, the name father could open up his own naming school. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Steve O'Rourke's naming class. Uh, I don't know how many parts it would have or, or what tuition would be, but uh, you know, consult with Steve on that. But, but two, uh, I thought you were about to talk about some sort of score for how good of a naming week it was, uh, <laughs> and we could call it the Gildrum score. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, I thought I'd get a better reaction out of that, out of you for that no, one. That's but, good. Yeah. So okay, so so Steve would have like there'd be like a pun class, right? Yes. There there'd be there'd be like a uh an alliteration class. <laughs> uh-huh. Right. Uh there'd be some sort of like allegorical class. Ooh, okay. You know, I think I think we need to figure this out. I we need we need a whole catalog of of classes that would be at Steve O'Rourke, the name fathers, University of Naming Dukes of Dice episodes. Yes. Very popular. Uh, all right. Well, <laughs> that'll do it for, for, for a memorable, a, an oddly memorable episode, Sean. Okay. I think. Yeah. I think. I, look, sure. high praise. I'm, yeah, giving, yeah, I'm yeah. giving this one high praise. I'm not saying good. good. I'm just saying oddly Great. memorable. Uh, yeah. It's, a, it's a, more of a four than a three episode. Oh, look, I, did, I didn't have fun playing Alma Mater, but I had yeah. fun recording this episode with you. Okay. Well, that's good. I had fun too, Alex. Well, good. Fantastic. <laughs> That's going to do it. <laughs> this has been the most memorable episode that we've had in a long time, Alex. Episode two. That's what you just said. You're giving me this look now. That's what you said. Is it because I, I, I said don't it like know about most way? memorable in a long time. Okay. Most memorable in at least the last three weeks. Uh, sure. This yep. has been episode 244, The Bar Exam. Thanks again to D. Shannon for that name suggestion. Until next time. 
This is Sean. And Alex. And you later, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Dukes of Dice. Today's episode was recorded in the Duchy on February 11th, 2021. Our theme music provided by Carbohydro M from his Prime Legacy album. The Dukes of Dice are a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. For other great board gaming podcasts, check out DiceTowerNetwork.com. And for all latest in the Duchy, go to DukesofDice.com. Find us on Twitter at Dukes of Dice. Join in conversations on our Board Game Geek Guild. Find us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks to our sponsors, Arcane Wonders and Game Toppers LLC. You can learn more about Game Toppers at GameToppersLLC.com. Find out all you need to know about Arcane Wonders Fine Games at ArcaneWonders.com. We'll see you back here in two weeks. Until then, game on.